All right. I am uh, excited and delighted to introduce to you our next speaker, uh, Heather, Dr. Heather King. Uh, Dr. King earned her Ph.D. in clinical psychology from the California School of Professional Psychology in San Francisco. She then went on to complete her postdoctoral uh, fellowship training in chronic pain management at Kaiser in San Francisco, where she received specialized training in various self-management approaches, and you're going to hear a lot about that this morning. She's also board certified in biofeedback at Stanford. She's been the primary supervisor for our pain psychology fellows. We're one of the few training programs in the country that's training uh, new pain psychologists, and I think the only one really out in the western U.S. that I'm uh, aware of in an academic center. Uh, she is uh, providing both individual and group therapy. She's developed and implemented a number of self-management programs that have focused on patient education and doing groups, biofeedback services, and she's trained our medical assistants also to serve as health coaches. One of the things that I think stands out with what Heather is doing now in this area of self-management is that we've historically looked at self-management as something that sits apart from the medical care model. And where we need to be moving is really to integrate all of this. So it's a continuum across what you do at home and across what we work with you on in a healthcare standpoint. And so what Heather is doing is a really novel approach to integrate all that into one big package. And she's going to talk with you more about that now. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. King. Thank you, Dr. Mackey. Because this is a self-management talk, I just wanted to remind everyone that feel free to self-manage. We've been sitting here for an, quite a few hours now, so if you need to get up and move, use the restroom, feel free. Absolutely. Is that better? Everybody in the back, can you hear me? Okay. Okay, so today's overview, we're going to go through the, the why, what, and how of a sec effective self-management for back pain. And I'm also going to provide you with some resources that you can look into after you're done with today's um, program. So Dr. Mackey gave us a really nice 30,000-foot overview of um, chronic pain in America. Um, he mentioned that the IOM report notes that there's 100 million Americans living with chronic pain. That's more than diabetes, cancer, and heart disease combined. When I share those numbers with the patients that I work with, they're often shocked because how many times do you feel like you're the only person that has pain? Well, no, you can look around this room and know from these statistics that there are many people in the United States and across the world that are dealing with chronic pain. And it is the number one cause of adult disability. But we're not here to talk about the 30,000 foot overview. I want to zoom in on the impact that it has on you as an individual and the impact that it has on your life. So I want you to take a trip down memory lane with me. I want you to think all the way back to what life was like before you had back pain. Now, with the patients that I work with, they'll often say, you know, life before pain was good. I was active with my relationships with my friends and my family. I was raising my kids, going to work, maybe going to school. I was involved in recreational activities and hobbies. And I was independent. I could pretty much do whatever I wanted. I didn't have any limitations. Doing things like running errands, cooking, cleaning vacuuming, they were easy. Almost took it for granted it was so easy. And then the back pain set in. And in the beginning, of course, it was a disruption. It was probably a nuisance. But you can see from looking at the slide that it's just a, it was just a part of your life. It wasn't filtering into all aspects of your life. You figured you'd go to the doctor, you'd get treatment, and then you'd get better. Life would go on. You'd get back to normal. And for those of you in the room that have chronic back pain, and those of you watching, that didn't happen. It didn't go away. It persisted. As chronic pain continues in our life, it doesn't just remain that small little circle, right? 
it starts to bleed into all aspects of one's life. So it starts to affect our mood. Dr. Darnell mentioned irritability. I don't know how many people tell me, you know, I just feel like things that I could tolerate before, I just can't tolerate anymore. I just, my fuse went from here to here. It can also affect depression, anxiety, anger. It interferes, it can interfere with your ability to sleep. And we know how hard it is to function when you can't get a good night's sleep. It can also affect your relationships, family stress, right? It doesn't just affect the person that has pain. It affects all of those relationships. Also, our physical conditioning. Uh, Dr. Cooley is going to be talking next about the importance of movement when you have chronic back pain. Sometimes it can lead to weight gain or weight loss, so it can cause other problems. Isolation. And then how we feel about ourselves, our identity. It can rob us of that. Or it can it make us start to question, like, who am I if I can't do the things that I used to be able to do? I had one patient that I worked with that I thought summarized this beautifully, so I always use this example. They said, chronic pain hijacked my life. So what I just described is this transition from acute to chronic pain. Okay, so acute pain is considered pain that lasts less than three months, usually has a rapid onset. The hurt, meaning the pain that you feel, is usually associated with some sort of tissue damage. Okay? So with that type of pain, with acute pain, the treatments that, are, that you receive include um, rest and medications, and they're very cure-focused. You're going to go to the doctor, they're going to give you something, and you're going to get better. The most important components of these slides are in yellow. I know that it's close to lunchtime, and I know myself, I start to lose focus. So I wanted to make it easy. Everything that really, like the take-home message, they're highlighted in yellow. So the most important part to know about acute pain is that your role as the patient is passive. So what, is, what does that mean? What does it mean to be passive? It means, just like I mentioned, you go to the doctor, they're very directive. They tell you what to do, you do it. Okay, But then we go into chronic pain. That's pain that lasts longer than six months. Hurt, meaning pain, does not necessarily mean imminent danger to the tissues. Dr. Cooley is going to get into this in a little bit more detail. She's a physical therapist um, in our clinic. But it's important to recognize this. Now, that does not mean that the pain that you feel is not real, because it absolutely is, or that it's not intense. It just means it doesn't, same, it doesn't serve the same purpose as acute pain. The treatment course also changes. It's less cure-focused, and it's more management-focused. Activity is essential to recovery. And medications are usually prescribed with caution, because of the long-term side effects. Dr. Cow is going to be talking about medications and chronic back pain later today. And here's the take-home message from this slide. Okay, so your role changes. Your role as a patient goes from passive to active. So what does that mean? It means that you start, instead of just relying on the doctors or the physical therapist to fix you or cure you, you, start to, you have to collaborate with them. So it's really more about what you're doing to manage your pain that will make a difference in your function, more so than what the doctor is doing for you. But you still need their help, right? Dr. Mackey mentioned how um, back pain is, is treated as a team, right? Well, think of that you are the leader of that team. So we know the impact of pain is, is significant, right? I mean, it affects all aspects of one's life. I, I, I put this in here because increased utilization of the healthcare system, I think, is important. I mean, how many of you ever imagined you'd be spending so much time having to go to the doctor? 
I mean, it's just not something that most people want to do or ever thought they'd have to do. So this, the gold standard for treatment for chronic back pain has three different tiers. You've got your medical treatment. You've got your physical reconditioning. And then there's also the behavioral and lifestyle modification. Now, research tells us when you get all three of these treatments together, that's when the results are the best. So if you have chronic back pain and you're only doing one of these and you feel like your pain is interfering with your life, please talk to your health care provider and ask them about receiving some of these other services. So we know that all pain is influenced by psychological, physical, and behavioral factors. Now, why on earth is that good news? It's good news because these are all factors that you can learn how to control. There's a certain loss of control that people feel when they have pain. Loss of control over their life, uh, loss of control over being able to do certain functions. So learning to control these psychological, physical, and behavioral factors can help you get back in the driver's seat of your life. You can decide where you're going instead of letting the pain decide where you're going. So how do we do that? That brings us to the meat of today's talk, which is self-management. So Dr. Mackey already touched on the National Pain Strategy and how this is being used to help move things like self-management programs into the healthcare system, which I think is, is really needed and really important. But I just wanted to highlight this, that self-management has been recognized to be so important that on a national level, it's being, there's being plans developed on how to incorporate that into your care. And we're doing that at Stanford, and many other places are doing this as well. So I like this quote because I think it highlights that shift from active, from passive to active. Um, research now supports the conclusion that how well patients manage chronic pain depends more on what they do themselves rather than what is done to them. That's an incredibly powerful statement. It has more to do with what you are doing than what we, as healthcare providers, are doing for you or to you. And that's because most of the change that happens with managing chronic pain, it's not done by the healthcare providers, it's, it's done by you. So I wanted to just summarize the research on self-management and pain. So we know that it, improve, it improves knowledge about pain. But it also reduces disability. It improves your mood, and it enhances the other treatments that you're receiving. So this is something that's used in conjunction with all the other treatments that, you'll, that you're already receiving. So when I was asked to give this talk on self-management, I was actually having a conversation uh, with Dr. Cooley, who's our physical therapist, and we were, de we were debating about, you know, what is self-management? And so I just wanted, I wanted to define what self-management is um, so that we're all on the same page. So each of you are already self-managers. You're managing your pain from the moment you wake up in the morning to the moment you go to sleep. You're not just managing your pain when you're at the doctor's office, right? Your physician didn't wake you up this morning and get you dressed and feed you breakfast and drive you here. No, you're already managing your pain. So this talk really isn't about self-management. It's more about effective self-management. So how do, we do, how do we figure out if we're effectively managing our pain? If you feel like you still have limitations in your life, that you're not able to do things that are really important to you, then learning additional self-management strategies might be beneficial. Some of you might be managing effectively. Some of you might be managing effectively in some areas and then maybe struggling in others. 
And then there's probably some of you that are just, you know, really struggling and need some self-management resources. So I, I hope you'll be able to walk away today with a number of those resources so that you can help yourself move forward and live the life that you want to live. So whenever I give my self-management talk, I like to think about what has to change in, in, in your perspective of managing your pain. And I think the first step is really acceptance. So accepting where you are today, your level of function, and, and figuring out, OK, how do I, where, I, where am I, and then where do I want to go? So identify what it is that you'd like to work toward. So identifying the values and goals that you have in life. And then mobilize your support. Get the people in your support network on board. Become active in your care and collaborate with your providers. We know that having information is really important, but that's not enough. It's not important enough to know that catastrophizing is bad for pain, right? We have to do something different. So action leads to change. And you're going to have an opportunity at the end of today's talk to develop your own action plan. So when you're learning new skills, it's important to think about, well, how do I learn a new skill? Think about if you learned a, for, a foreign language or if you were learning how to play the guitar. How would you do that? Well, you would, you would read books and watch videos, talk to, maybe take some classes, talk to professionals, and you'd talk to other people who are using those skills. Same thing with self-management. Same type of strategy applies. And you would want to remain flexible and compassionate toward yourself because this is not easy. It's hard to change. And know that there's no end point to learning, right? It's not like, oh, I've learned to play the guitar the best that I can, and now I'm done learning. That's just not the way it works. And remember that practice is important because the more we practice something, then it becomes a habit. So I wanted to provide you with some resources of how you could find these self-management um, classes and tools in your community. So the first resource is the Chronic Pain Self-Management Program. This was developed here at Stanford by Dr. Kate Lorig. It's a peer-led program. And if you live in California, you can go to this website, and it will give you um, an opportunity to put in your community. And it'll pull up all of the programs that are offered in your area. Now, if you don't live in California and you're live streaming, you can go to this website, and this will give you information on um, other countries. I believe there's over 20 countries that this program is offered. Um, and this is the book that it's used. It's Living a Healthy Life with Chronic Pain. Even if you don't take the program, I recommend that you purchase the book. It's an incredible resource. And lucky for you, it's one of the giveaways today. So in the Chronic Pain Self-Management Program, you learn a variety of techniques. And I don't have time to go through all of them today, but I just want to highlight three of them that I think are the most important. And that's problem solving, action planning, and decision making. Now, why are these important? Think about if you're trying to do something that's hard for you to do with your back pain. Like maybe cook a dinner for your loved one. Say it's your anniversary and chopping vegetables is really difficult. You're not going to call your doctor, your physical therapist, or your pain psychologist when you're halfway through the meal and be like, you know, my back pain has acted up. Do you think you could walk me through this? No. You know, but these classes actually teach you very structured ways on how to problem solve on your own. And this is not common sense. It isn't. So it's really helpful to know to, to learn these different strategies. The other thing I wanted to mention was the American Chronic Pain Association. This is their website. They have support groups that are offered throughout the country. Um, they also have valuable resources on their web page that you can go to. They have a wonderful series of videos called Health Matters, and it's a great, great resource to sit down with your loved ones and watch. It was de they just had their 35-year anniversary. Um, it was developed by Penny Cohen, who is a person who has pain. She's dedicated her life to teaching people who have pain and their family members to understand pain and to move forward. 
So it's a, just an excellent resource. We actually have, we host one of their um, support groups on site at Stanford in Redwood City. So you'll find that um, on her website as well. This is a toolkit of different, this is not exhaustive, but it's a toolkit of different self-management skills. I just wanted to put this up here to give you a sense of how many different types of tools there are. And know that it's not like you just use one tool. You use many tools. And it's important to have different tools to choose from because maybe one day you run through five of them and they don't work. What do you do? Then you switch to the other ones. Okay, I know I'm getting to the end of my time, so... In your packet today, you were given a piece of blue paper. Well, you're given two pieces of blue paper, but the one that I'm referring to is the one that has Pain Management Center on the top. Um, this is what I call today's opportunity for change. So with all of the patients that I work with at Stanford, I, I give this out. And I used to call this homework until I was told that not everybody likes the word homework, so now it's an opportunity for change. So what this is is... It's just an action plan, so it allows you to choose something that you would like to work on or something that you'd like to change. Maybe it's something that you've learned today. And you want to make sure it's reasonable, meaning it's you know something you can do between now and maybe next week. And it's behavior-specific. So what does that mean? If I said, well, I want to be in better shape, that is not a behavior. That's an outcome of a behavior. So a behavior would be, I'm going to walk. Okay, so I, I made up an action plan for myself here. So I'm going to walk 15 minutes at noon, Monday through Wednesday, or excuse me, Monday and Wednesday. And then I am identifying any barriers that might come up. Those of you who are in California know it has been so hot here. So weather was, could be a barrier. I could walk in the mall. And then you'd rate your confidence level. So how confident are you that you can complete your entire action plan, 0 to 10? If your confidence is lower than a 7, you need to modify your plan because you want to set yourself up for success. And then you want to track your progress and you want to share it with the people in your life because you want their support. So you also, when you checked in today, you also got a list of resources. I provided you with some books on managing pain, YouTube videos, and different organizations that you could go to. I just wanted to thank you for coming today's talk, to today's talk, and I just wanted to really encourage you to use your action plan and remember that things don't change unless we change our behavior. Thank you.